and, and, and they, they tell you all about the British great and the good, I think, which is avoid them like the plague, because they, they hadn't got any guts when it came to it. They what? were so worried about the next licence fee settlement, they were prepared to sacrifice anything to keep on the side of the government. Now, the job of a broadcaster is not to keep on the side of the government. Can I ask you about the information superhighway, which... Uh, That's an old expression, Andy. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm old. Um, but the reality is, does it concern you who was trained as a journalist? In fact, I think you served time as a journalist here in Newcastle. I did. I was trained as a journalist by ITN. Um, the information superhighway doesn't necessarily give you any reason to believe that what it's telling you is factual or truthful. Does that concern you? Well, the world has changed. It's changed pretty fast. And for people of our sort of age, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, there are two things, if, if, being a broadcaster and a programme maker, there are two things that, 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 that I look into the future and I'm not sure of. One, I'm not sure who pays for good journalism. You know, who pays for research, proper research, and the ability to reject it and say, I don't think this is right, and the rest of it, and the rest of it. Which is not... I don't know who pays for it. In our lifetime, it was paid for by advertising, by the newspapers, by uh, BBC, and by ITV, and the rest of it. I'm not sure who pays for it in the future. It's particularly if the, the, one of the great problems is that the commercial sector, as it gets squeezed, will put more and more attack, will attack more and put more and more pressure on the BBC to get less money, as you're already seeing. Uh, and secondly, um, in terms of television, I'm not sure who pays for the programming in the future. I mean, the interesting... What, what, I, was before, I was before some parliamentary committee the other day. If you've gone before, spent your life going before committees as director general of the BBC, it's wonderful to go on your own, because you can say what you like. <laughs> and they asked me, what's my definition of public service broadcasting? And I said, public service broadcasting, actually, I think in this generation is about having a television, enough television programming that reflects our culture and our society as opposed to American programming and American culture and American society. And that's by and large what we've sustained in this country. We sustained it initially by giving quite a large licence fee to the BBC and secondly we sustained it by having a monopoly on, on ITV for many years. Once they've gone, who funds £2 million an hour drama? Uh, one of the sadnesses of the pay market is what hasn't emerged in this country is an HBO, who in America still spend vast sums of money on some wonderful dramas. Uh, here, we gave all that money to footballers, basically. So that the pay television in this country has put nothing, really, into production at all. It's put it all into sport. Do you make a distinction or do you mark a time when programmes became content? Now, I've heard a lot of people in an argument. I, don't, I think it was always content. It was always... You had to fill up a schedule. Some of it was wonderful, some of it was all right, and some of it was diabolical. And I always used to make the diabolical stuff if I remember. <laughs> but, um, no, no, just... He's very sensitive, really. Um, no, I mean, I've never met anybody who, who said, I'm now going to make a crap programme, right? <laughs> But they did, you know. <laughs> but no one said, ah, oh, this is it, you know, I've got the worst actor, the worst writer. And yet, so many times have you seen someone get the best writer, the best director, the best actors, and it's crap. And it happens. And therefore, it's difficult. Making good programmes is difficult. And most don't come off. Um, I mean, I was at the BBC when they created The Office. Uh, and you just sat there thinking, I feel blessed. I feel blessed. I'm the director general when they produced the best sitcom for the last 20 years. You're blessed by that stuff. Doesn't happen very often. When you were at the BBC, there was always a huge debate going on about the BBC should not be allowed to use the licence payers' money to intervene in the commercial market. And yet, the BBC, it seemed to me, could not survive unless it intervened in the commercial market, unless it actually got itself involved in things like... Free view. Well, the, uh, the great thing about, I mean, when I got there, they said to me, everybody said to me, this is a terribly complicated job, you know, this is a very complicated organisation. I just said, looks pretty easy to me. Somebody gives me three billion pounds and I spend it. 
<laughs> you know, most, most of what you guys do is, fight, is getting the three billion pounds. They gave it me. You got um, that for winning the LWT licence. I know. Well, that was... <laughs> well, that was... I mean, it's no surprise that the only two people who resigned over Killigan were, my, were Gavin and I, who were the only two who uh, didn't have to pay a mortgage. <laughs> uh, but seriously, Greg, I mean, the BBC now looks... No, the all, the I mean, BBC, in all sorts of ways, involved, it is involved in, in the look, commercial market. Is it right that the BBC well, is... Is that a, kind of a player, well, what, or should the BBC be PBS for Britain? No, because PBS is a dire service, isn't it? Um, it depends what you mean. Freeview, the commercial market, because you were involved, the commercial market have failed. Mm. You know, uh, what was it called? On Digital. Yes. ITV Digital. That was one of the worst... Brand, I resigned. One of the great branding decisions of our time. Let's have this dire product <laughs> and let's call it ITV Digital because it's failing. So you destroy the ITV brand with it. Um, it had failed. Only the BBC could pick it up. Why? Because what the BBC had, A, we had a good idea. And it was much, you know, when you think we sold now 14 million boxes in six but years. But you also had an inflation-proofed income. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but what we had was a good idea, which was much too good an idea to have when you're working for a public sector organisation. Uh, we had a good idea and we had marketing power. And the reason Freeview worked was that simple marketing idea, more telly, no cost. And we had that marketing power. And do you see the BBC, I mean, when the BBC sells a DVD of The Office, it's in a sense involving itself in the commercial market. Yeah. But do you see the BBC getting more involved in the commercial market? Uh, no, you couldn't. To the point where you, you those could, in the commercial market say, hey, this is unfair. No, 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 I don't get any money from the government. The no, we were very careful about what you went into and what you didn't. As I say, we went into uh, Freeview because the commercial market had failed. Um, and we didn't... Uh, I mean, I, I, my opinion was very obvious. If we, didn't, if we didn't pick up Freeview and make it work... Because the commercial, the digital world was left to Rupert Murdoch. And I thought that was not in the interests of either the BBC or Britain to let Rupert Murdoch dominate the digital world, and he doesn't. Yeah. Is the BBC capable of being a player alongside Rupert Murdoch, Microsoft, Cisco? Well, I it's mean, survived. Can, can it, it actually so far survived, be there? It's so far survived it much better than the others. Uh, what is interesting is that the decline in audience share for the BBC is significantly less than for ITV. Why? Probably because the audiences were different, and ITV was traditional working-class telly, um, whereas the BBC never was, and it had a much more loyal audience. Uh, I, would, I think the BBC should have, in this market, a very uh, exciting future. And I your prediction when... The digital switchover actually is universal? Um, well, I don't see that changing. Because let's face it, the vast majority of people still can only receive four and a half channels. No. No, 80% of the people have now got, more than 80% have now got multi channel television. So there's 20% who can't. They're, they're disproportionately people like my mum. If you gave her a fifth, a sixth channel, she'd panic. You know, it actually, most people have got multi-channel television now. Uh, that's largely because of Freeview. Like half, of, you know, half of them have got Sky and the other half have got Freeview. And a lot of people have got Sky have got Freeview in other rooms. 